Kath, Kath, I thought you were going to start singing. I, <laughs> I didn't know what All I'm right. doing. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, Series 2, Episode 11 of Holistic Emails, Email, and More, a Q&A with. I'm your moderator, Skip Federa, and thank you all for being patient. We had some tech issues, and we'll get into those in just a second. For those that are new to the to our this show or our format, uh, on every episode, we showcase a different topic uh, with a different panel of experts. And today, we are going to be talking about what B2B and B2C can learn from each other. Uh, as you know, this is really your show. We bring, the, yeah, we bring together the experts, but it is your questions that drive the conversation. Uh, it's unscripted, unrehearsed, and almost always, in fact, it is always a whole lot of fun. Now, I've been participating in, uh, participating in and running marketing events for over 20 years. And one of the most consistent comments I see in feedback forums uh, is some version of, can we have more B2B content? Mm -hmm. Now, the times that this comment has surprised me the most uh, was at events that were very li clearly labeled B2C. Uh, you know, what B2C marketers should do for this Christmas, that kind of thing. Or um, the, the other one that really kind of shocked me and made me really question whether we got the content of an event right was I, I got that once on a B2B event. It was this B2B specific event. And the person said, you know, next time there should be more B2B content. Not sure how you do more than 100%, but anyway. Um, and I used to try to head this off by saying, you know, look, B2B, B2C, you might call things something differently. Uh, you might use different language, but the tactics are fundamentally the same. And I'm not, am I saying that B2B and B2C are the same? No, but I think they're not as different as they once were. And I actually think they're getting closer and more similar. B2B buyers want similar experiences as they have when they're buying in their professional lives as they get when they're buying as B2C consumers. And then B2B marketers uh, you know, can learn how to deliver these experiences from their B2C colleagues. Similarly, the B2C, B2C landscape is changing as well. B2C buyers crave information, which they get formally through reviews and comparison sites and stuff that a brand can control. But they also get information through informal sources, like the self-styled experts you find on YouTube. And if the B2C marketers are not creating the content that the consumers want, they'll get it because somebody else will. It'll be off brand, off message, and possibly inaccurate and very likely unflattering. So it's the perfect exchange. Question is, what do you want to learn? So please ask your questions as always in the uh, left-hand side of your screen. No, in the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, and feel free to use the chat for everything else. Uh, you know, chatting, giving us some feedback about how you think uh, our event is going uh, today. Uh, in fact, let's let's see who's out there right now. Who's who do we have in our audience? Uh, go to the chat tab over there and tell us uh, where you are and whether you're B two B, B two C, NFP, or so, some other three letter acronym. I'm really hoping it's like NSA or CIA or something cool. And while you're doing that, uh, there we are. Um, now, like with all things email, some of your questions may be very specific to your situation or quite complicated. So uh, today's speakers will be happy to answer your questions in our roundtable discussions later. So be sure to pull up a chair, turn on your camera, plug in your mic, and join us as we keep the chat going in a much more informal setting. In addition to chatting with our great experts today uh, and meeting other email marketers, uh, one lucky roundtable participant will win a copy of Cass' book, Cass' best-selling book. Uh, I'm just trying to make it big there. There we go. Holistic email marketing. Um, I, I point this out a lot, but the praise <laughs> page is also very good. <laughs> it's a good read. A little bit of it's a good read. The praise page is a, is a good read. That's what we're all looking for. Um, all right. Now it's going to come back to my first slide. So um, next up, before we go any further, we should take a moment to thank our sponsors. This series is brought to you by our gold sponsors, Iterable and Validity, and our silver sponsors, RPE Origin and Email Expert. So thank you all for everything you've done 
and everything you do uh, for us to make this series possible to go out to all the email marketers that have enjoyed it so far. Now, if you want to go back to any of our previous episodes from series one, uh, or you need to catch up on series two so far, this is our penultimate ex- episode. So if this is your first one. You know, you, you are coming in right, you know, this is, this is almost the denouement. Um, it's almost the big ending. So uh, you got a lot to catch up on, a lot to binge watch over the summer. And uh, here, let me drop a link to that into the chat now so you can go find that. That's on uh, the Holistic Email site or on uh, YouTube. And I think that's a link to the to that. All righty. Now, before we get to our speakers, um, we've got, uh, okay. So we've got, Kath is in Wales, for those of you who have been with us before. Kath is not in Antigua for this episode. She's come back to, the to I would say, her homeland, but that's Australia. She's come back to where her family lives. Let's go with that. And um, uh, is joining us from Wales. Uh, and Kath says B2B. Um, we've got Karen joining from Orlando, Florida, both B2B and B2C. She can learn from herself. Um, we also have uh, Karina from Zurich, both. Um, and we have uh, Ryan Phelan not claiming either, but saying he's in a construction zone. Ooh, in Bosnia. I'm not sure we ever, we've had a Bosnian before. Welcome, Mira. Uh, also B2B and B2C. Okay. Now, here's where we're going to get to the bit about our technical difficulties. Uh, we were supposed to have uh, Stephanie Miller with us today. Unfortunately, Stephanie had some uh, technical difficulty. Couldn't, couldn't get uh, logged in. So. Uh, luckily, uh, literally plucked out of the audience is Priyanka Roy uh, from Validity. Uh, we also have with us, as always, Kath Pay of Holistic Email Marketing and Priya Bransfield, Senior Email Marketing Manager at the Kronos Agency. Welcome, everybody. Okay, now, as I said before, Get your questions in over there, and uh, we will we will kick off while while people are getting their questions in. Um, do you ladies want to uh, introduce yourselves? Uh, Priyanka, I'll start with you, but I'm going to tell a quick little story because um, it reminds me of what what has just happened. Uh, a f- a friend of a, a friend of ours was getting married, and one of our friends brought his new girlfriend to the wedding. And one of the bridesmaids, uh, the morning of the wedding, really badly broke her ankle and could not be in the wedding. And the bride was so upset that the numbers were going to be uneven, uneven. She literally picked this girl, who was my friend's date, out of the audience because she would fit in the dress. <laughs> so she's in this wedding. She's in all these wedding photos. She doesn't know the bride or groom really at all. And in fact, I think that was might have been the last date that she had with a friend of mine. So, like, she, we don't even know like where she is anymore. She's just this random person in these <laughs> wedding photos from a wedding we all went to years and years and years ago. So, not okay, that you're random but, by any way, stretch of the imagination. No, exactly. For- I I I want to I want to qualify Priyanka. Right? Is um, so we've known each other for years. She's uh, an amazing. I'm going to do your intro for you. She's an amazing speaker. <laughs> Um, she's an educator and she works for validity and, um, she's here because of her knowledge, not just because she fits. (laughs) Well, I hope Skip, I don't disappear after this event. (laughs) Yeah. uh, Yes. Okay. So maybe my story wasn't all that, all that accurate in in the end. It it turns out that the the parallels fell apart very quickly. Priya, which you, why don't you go next? I don't have a story for Priya. No, I don't know if I can follow that. But um, yeah, I've, I've worked with Kath um, before and been in email for um, longer than I care to mention. But in comparison to the rest of the group, I am definitely uh, not the expert. I'm on a panel of experts. Uh, so I can learn from you guys too. Well, okay. I, I think I think you'll find that you are the expert, but we'll, we'll yes. get to that in a minute. Kath? Yes. So so Priya is famously known for her understating of herself, you know. So she's here because she's very good. 
Um, okay, and then there's me, and I'm here because I'm always here. So there you go. <laughs> no, um, so CEO of uh, Holistic Email Marketing, and if it's the first time, uh, welcome. And um, yeah, you've got, as Skip said, you've got a lot to catch up on. I've got, not that you have to catch up on all my 20 plus years <laughs> of experience, but um, I've had lots of years of experience. And this topic, I think, is a really, really good one because as Skip was saying at the very beginning, you know, it's, it's often, it, it's a topic that a lot of people ask about. Um, hardly anyone ever talks about it. And then um, when you have a look at, you look at all the, the people who are here today, many of us are actually B2B and B2C marketers. I put B2B because that's what I am fundamentally, but I help all my clients who are either B2B or B2C. So um, yeah, okay, we do you, Skip. Well, I, I never introduce myself. I, no. get, I, I, get, I, I don't usually get to introduce myself. I just get to say, <laughs> hi, I'm Skip the moderator. But since you introduced <laughs> me, actually, Kath, why don't you do me too? Okay, I'll do you. So this is Skip. Skip and I have known each other for too many years, seriously. Um, we have been on the Email Marketing Council together. Skip has been in the industry for, what, over 20 years as well? Um, yes. Incredi incredibly uh, clever guy, and um, he has done amazing things in the industry. And he's actually a fractional CMO. And... Um, if you're a small or if you're a tech company and you're looking for someone like that, skips you, man. I am. I am. Spend more money on your marketing and less money on your marketer. Okay, so we've got no questions so far. Although, to be fair, we have not given the audience a whole lot of content on, on which to build a question. So let's get uh -huh. into the meat and, meat and potatoes of this thing. Um, so I, in the intro, I laid out how I thought B2B and B2C were were becoming more and more kind of aligned or coming closer together. I guess I'm going to, uh, for the panel, what are the differences between B2B and B2C? Um, Priya? Um, I think the major difference is when you, what you're marketing to them. So essentially it's still people that you're talking to. So the way you talk to them essentially is going to be the same. However, the products that you're selling could vary quite differently based on B2B versus B2C. Yeah, okay. yeah. And also delving into that a little bit too, even though you're speaking, and this is one of the things I think that B2B marketers sometimes forget about because they think that they're talking to a business. They're actually talking to an individual, right? Mm -hmm. That individual, however, may not be the decision maker but they could be an influencer. And that's where B2B and B2C can get a little bit more complex. Although, think about it, if you're talking to B2C and you're talking to the guy, you're probably actually only talking to the influencer anyhow. You're not really talking to the decision maker in the family, are you? Only kidding. Um, <laughs> I, mean, wait, I think, I think that's, a, that's a great point though, Kath, because um, one, of the, one of the challenges, so one of the things that's, you know, obviously, if we're going to play buzzword bingo, a big buzzword in B2B is ABM, yeah. account-based marketing, yeah. where as a marketer, you build out uh, a, a view of the entire uh, kind of decision-making structure of your account, and you deliver content to them re relevant to where they are in the business, what level of influence they have, um, what their interests are, um, all those kinds of things. You don't see that on the B2C side, right? If you want to if you want to sell a holiday in my house, um, you know, you, you're selling pretty much everything to my wife. Um, but you know, I am an influencer. So, you know, you can't, you shouldn't ignore me, but you, you don't see B2C marketers kind of taking that holistic approach about looking at, especially on, on major purchases. I mean, if it's toothpaste, I, I'll use whatever toothpaste happens to come in the house. I genuinely don't care. Mm -hmm. But if it's something big like a holiday or like a holiday or a piece of tech yeah. or a car, any of those yeah. kinds of things, yeah, you know, you don't see that in the BSC side. No, which I think is interesting because, again, it, it, it's a considered purchase, isn't it? And so um, it probably would benefit them to be doing something more along the lines of that. Um, but then they could possibly have to change, you know, and, and now we're talking about, you know, 
it must be the sea marketers would understand that to 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 sell toothpaste and to sell a lounge suite or or a, you know a cruise are, are two totally different things um yet how different are their tactics um that's really what it comes down to Chuck, you raised a very good point about the audience right about selling into an individual where B2C is and then selling into or even talking to individuals but not being the decision maker. And I think one thing that the marketers need to keep in mind is the time it might take for a conversion to come in. It, it, it's not easy as in a B2C, it can happen very quickly. Skip, for example, booking a holiday, um, you're marketing that, I book a holiday, the conversion happens very easily. Whereas with B2B, it might take a lot of time because you're not might not be speaking with the decision maker, even though it's the influence you're speaking with. Something to keep in mind. I absolutely yeah, second that. Sorry, it's good. I'm just saying one of um, a previous client that I had specialized in um, work office spaces. <clears throat> so marketing those to potential landlords or other B2B prospects the timeline for conversion rates to appear was a lot longer <clears throat> than going to your you know, ASOS mm -hmm. or things like that where you're shopping online and get the conversion immediately. Yeah. I wanna go back to something else that Cass said. Um, <laughs> sorry, that, uh, there's a spider just there going up and down and up and down, it keeps distracting <laughs> me. I, I, <laughs> It's switched sides of the cupboard now. Um, hey, Sam. Hello. How are you? Hey, excellent. Tech I'm problem so solved. sorry. I am so sorry. Anyway, it's all good. I'm glad to be here. What have I missed? <laughs> uh, uh, oh, nothing really. Um, <laughs> Uh, why don't you uh, take two seconds and introduce yourself to folks. Great. Hey, everybody. I'm so sorry. I was late, had some technical issues. I'm Stephanie Miller. I go by Sam. And greeting you from uh, wonderful Portland, Maine, here in the US of A. And I recently uh, joined Wex, which is a fintech uh, company. We do a lot of uh, payment processing. It's sort of like Venmo for business. It's how businesses pay each other and um, all of the data and the infrastructure that goes along with that. So I have spent most of my career in B2B marketing um, using technology to optimize marketing results. And I am delighted to be here with my good friends, Kath and Skip and with uh, Priyanka. And, and uh, nice to see you all. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Um, I just thought of another great question, uh, and I wanted to get it down so I didn't forget. Uh, yeah, we've got, you probably can't see her, but we've got uh, Priya here as well. And we were just talking about the differences between uh, B2B and B2C. And Kath, I want to go back to one of the things that you said in your, um, when you were talking about uh, B2B marketers sometimes thinking that they're marketing to the business and not not to the individual, because I think it's, it's really quite important. I mean, I, th I think in general, that's a problem across all email marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, the number of times that I've had clients say to me, oh, I've got X number of records or I have X number of email addresses. Very rarely does anybody say I have X number of people on my database. Um, but we were just having this conversation. I was having this conversation with a client this morning because they were talking about, they're using all kinds of words um, about, you know, they're trying they're trying to sell to one of their clients they're talking about data logistics and um what was the other word they used i can't remember off the top of my head but it was even one step further removed than records and I, I i pointed out to them i said look if that's the way you're talking to somebody about their customers you know if they're thinking of them as people and you're thinking of them as you know bits and bytes to be shifted around the planet in a you know you know, encrypted way, that's important, but um, you know, these oh, people yeah, aren't these data people. points. Yeah. 
Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. No, something weird is happening in my computer. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And, and I think that's where um, a lot of things can go wrong because there, um, if you have a look, B2B marketers tend to be what well, you've got. Uh, okay, let's go to B2C. B2C marketers are very much um, sort of more, more chatty, more friendly, or just pure salesy, right? B2B, again, you can have the two extremes, I guess. You can have those very nice long letter nurturing ones where they're talking on a one-to-one -one basis. But very many, a lot of B2B that I've come across are still very much um, uh, they're, they're kind of distant. They're not really trying to build that relationship with that individual. Um, and maybe because they don't know if they're in the right position or not. And, and you know, it's really up to a B2B marketer then to actually be saying, well, if they're not in this right position, if they're not the decision maker, then we still need to get them on board. We still need to get them on board because they could be an influencer. We still need to equip them with all the right information so that they can go and share to the decision maker, right? And in order to do that, you have to be talking like a human because that's how we that's how we work is we want to be you know sold to by a human we want to converse with a human we don't want to have that very distant you know sort of uh, like i'm talking to a, a company and i think that's um you know so in that way b2b can learn a little bit from b2c um i guess but okay i've worked i've worked that can i can i add to that skip and kath yes is that appropriate? Ahead, yeah, yeah. <laughs> While you're fixing oh, yeah. whatever you're fixing there, Kath. Yeah, yeah, no, I yeah. think jump in. I think you're what you're saying it makes sense. And I think one of the traps that B2B marketers fall into, and Priya, you tell me if this is true for you, is that we have so much technology that lets us focus on workflow that we sometimes let the workflow mm -hmm. and the automation get in the way of that human to human connection. Yeah. And I think that that is you know, the, the the great blessing of being a B2B marketer is the technology that lets yeah. you really create those one-to-one -one experiences and the account-based marketing. But then the curse is all that technology that lets you blah, blah, blah. Right? So I I think that I think that goes with what you're saying. It's a barrier for Yeah. Do you know what? That that's so true. Um you, you nailed it then because I actually um I, I write about this a lot and I've said in my book and all the rest of it, let's bring marketing back into email marketing. And that's because we are so tech oriented. We are so tech driven, we're uh, tactical focused and all the rest of it. Sometimes we forget about the actual marketing element, which is great copy, you know, consumable copy and and relating to people on a one-to-one -one basis and you've got the tech to allow that one-to-one -one. now let's make sure that the copy is going to follow suit that's interesting yeah that Can is I interesting just Priyanka, say... i want to oh, sorry sorry uh, Priyanka, we'll get we'll let you jump in in a second but i wanted to ask priyanka specifically as kind of a the pure b2b uh or another pure b2b marketer on on the panel how do you um build connections with, I mean, with your uh, prospects Skip, there are lots of ways that a B2B marketer can connect, right? I mean, we use a lot of newsletters and it, it has to be more educational. And our marketing team does a lot of hard work doing that, like, you know, educational, come to webinars. And it, it's very difficult to create that one-to-one -one relationship um, for our sales guys, for example. And we all know, right, we've been at the end of it, all of us, when we receive an email from a salesperson from some other company, we're like, oh, oh, God, right? We've, we've all had that expression and it makes it so difficult. I think the B2B marketers have to also compete with spam filters, spam filters like a Mimecast, for example. Uh, you're sending it to your B2B contact, a very beautiful newsletter that you've created, and bam goes Mimecast uh, quarantining the particular newsletter because of all the security settings that the receiving company has set. And, and, and that's a challenge that B2B marketers have to face. Whereas when it comes to B2C, it's a bit more easier. Of course, if, if you're a spammer or if you're sending bad emails and you've got bad email practices, everyone will suffer. But that's that one less headache 
I think the B2C marketers have versus B2B. Um, we see that quite often. You can send tons of emails, like even simple emails, like reminders, it can get stuck into a client spam filter and they didn't see a welcome email. And it's a, it's a big problem. So how do you create that relationship when there are like a lot of challenges as well to kind of mm -hmm. get through? Mm -hmm. Pray, you, you wanted yeah. to jump in on that as well. I uh, wanted to jump in before on the technology um, aspect where um, Stephanie was saying that, you know, we're depending too much on the technology. I'm going to throw a spanner in the works and say, actually, we should depend more on the technology because the level of personalization, the targeting that you can do to make each individual communication to that person that you're communicating to really targeted. So it is more personal. It is reaching out to them on a one-to-one -one level. And then as Cass said, with the copy, with the images, with the graphics, you're then just driving that nail further home. So building that one-to-one -one relationship, agreed the spam filters do give that additional level of um, difficulty, but use the technology, make it part of your marketing <laughs> strategy to see how much you can um, segment and personalize. Yeah, that's an interesting. That's an interesting point. But it's but it's. I think the key point there for me is it's use the technology. Have an idea of how you're going to use the technology first. I mean, we covered this in a previous episode, and I, I'm not going to be able to remember the episode number off the top of my head. I want to say eight, but we talked about whether new technology was, uh, you know, a bit of a. Well, I, I called it. You know, talked about magpie marketers who chase after the new technology just because they can chase after the new technology. Um, which is uh, uh, an interesting one. Now, uh, Priyanka, I want to get back to something that you said when you're talking about spam filters, because one of the challenges that I found as a B2B marketer is, um, you know, in the old days, keeping in mind that I've been in email marketing since 1999, um, but in the old days, well, in the old days, there were no spam filters. It was the Wild West. We could send anything to anybody. It was great. <laughs> We also, you know, I worked for an ESP. We also got um, 10p per email. That was also great. None of that happens anymore. Um, but uh, once spam filters started to come in, you, you did have that situation where every company had its own set of rules and you really didn't know how you were going to manage those rules. Now, the other challenge you have is, uh, you know, the last statistic I saw was that 30 plus percent of UK businesses relied on Google. Hotmail or Yahoo to manage their in-house email. So you've also got, you know, you've got this, it, for part of your audience, you've got the same deliverability problems and inbox placement problems that uh, your, your B2C colleagues have. And for the rest of your audience, it's, you know, a couple of people at, a, at, you know, at each domain and a wide number of rules. How do, you, how, do you, how do you manage that? I mean, I'm kind of queuing us up for our deliverability chat next, in a couple of weeks, but how do, you, how do you guys manage that being in that space? Um, it's very hard, Skip. Um, the reason why I say this is, yes, as validity, we are B2B marketers, but um, on an account of what we do on a daily basis, that is our job, we work with B2C clients as well as B2B clients. And one of the things what we find very hard is, no matter how good we kind of recommend on the deliverability side of things, because as you said, it has to be same for both B2B and B2C, it's just not knowing what you're receiving domain and their IT people and security guys have said those, you know, trigger words or spam filters. You can't know that. And that, that's a very, very big challenge. And one of the things is it might be just as easy as giving that B2B contact a call and say, hey, could you just whitelist our domain? It might be just as simple as that. Um, and I know it's it's not as easy as it's been said, but that's one of the things. Um, the other thing that we do and, and the, the things that we kind of recommend is look at your balances very, very carefully. Um, and when you do that, you start getting a feel of what kind of spam filter could be behind um, those balances and look at check those MX records and start creating more or less a database of, OK, these domains are looked at by this particular spam filter and then do everything in your power to follow the best practice of that spam filter and then cross your fingers and hope that it gets delivered to the inbox. <laughs> Hire a good deliverability person. Um, 
Excellent, excellent. So, so we talked about the differences um, between B2B and B2C. What are the similarities? Sam? Well, I think Kath said it earlier. I mean, we're all marketing to people. So there's that similarity. Um, I think that the content, uh, the content um, consumption across channels is just as true in B2B as it is in B2C. So your email program is not an island. It is connected to all of the other channels and all the other content that you're producing. Um, and I think we in B2B have some of the same things that B2C uh, marketers have in terms of challenges, right? So we have things like explainer videos, which is very sort of cross-cultural now. Um, there's seasonality and there's spikes to engagement. Um, there's the research that happens online before I purchase, right? So for shoes, it might be, you know, 20 minutes, but for a big piece of software, for enterprise software, it could be six, seven months. Um, there's life cycle messaging, right? Like that's something that everyone kind of does now. You see welcome series and, and um, you know, some of the great B2B automation practices happening throughout B2C. Um, and I think commerce. So anyway, the subscriber engagement, um, focus on, you know, focusing on storytelling. Uh, the use of influencers, I find to be much more important in B2B now than it ever was. Uh, that used to be purely B2C domain. I'll stop there. I'm sure other people have things to add, but I feel like there's, we're marketing, right? So there's so yeah. many similarities. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I totally agree. I mean, that was a great list. And I think it's, it's more, it's more the nuances, right? It's, it, it is, it's more the, 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 the value. So the lifetime value may be different. The actual average order value will be different. The time, you know, for the buying cycle is different. The list sizes are different. And all of these then will sprout slightly different tactics based upon those differences. But at the end of the day, you know, you'll have a welcome or as I like to call it, a first purchase program for a B2C. And you'll have an onboarding program if you're a SaaS B2B or something, you know, like it's the same sort of principles. And, and even with um, a card abandonment with B2C, you can have a form abandonment with B2B as well. Not that that's yeah. as popular as it should be. But there's, a, you know, there, there's lots of similarities. And my, the reason why I created this was because um, I, like Skip, have come across so many B2B marketers who are sort of going, I feel left out because you didn't have any content. And I'm like, all those sessions right there, even though they were giving you a, B2, a B2C case study, there were elements that you could be drawing upon and learning upon. Um, you know, learning from. So it, it, it's, and also B to C also then don't look at B to B. They go, oh no, that's, you know, uh, don't they speak Latin or something, <laughs> you know? Um, but as all, it, all of do you think our, we're, it, do you think it's we're just a bit too precious? Don't, don't answer that. That was, that was a, that was purposely yeah. controversial. Here's, Here's something I wish that we did better in B2B that I think B2C, our B2C uh, colleagues do really, really well. And that is actually using the data that we have. So like most B2C, Priya's not ringing out her head, right? So most B2C marketers are right on top of it. Like they're looking at the commerce numbers, they're looking at conversion rates, they're using the analysis and they're using all these great personalization tools. Um, you know, they move up and down their frequency based on response. Like. I have that same data. I just have it in a smaller set, which is mm -hmm. potentially more important to me, right? So like yep. every decision I make could be my next million dollar deal, yep. right? So like you'd think I'd be right all over that, right? I mean, I personally am all over that, but I'm just saying generally yep. about B2B marketers, I find that most of us are hesitant for some reason to use that data, but I feel that's something we could really learn from our B2C brethren. Right, we can teach them about how to create a great persona and how far to go, and they can teach us about data. So, yeah, Priya, so you're nodding. I was going to say, uh, I don't think I've ever come across a preference center for B two B. Why not? Why can't we do the same thing and replicate B two C? And B two B, they go to small business, do yeah. right? Yeah. So, I, I wonder if it's in a, a, a mental a mental attitude or a limitation or some sort of frame of mind where um, B 
because the list sizes are smaller, right, that, that they kind of go, oh, it's not worth it. Whereas if you've got a big database, you go, great, I'm going to mine this. I'm going to find out all these wonderful insights. Whereas even though you know probably the value at the end of the day of that list is actually depends on the product, of course, could be more valuable. Yeah. I think well, that's true. Yeah. And I think, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. I'll, sorry, I'll I was just going to say quickly that um, I think that's true, but also um, – you know, our, our, our metrics are different, right? And so the metrics mean something different to us, right, in B2B. So I think when you are looking at data, you're not necessarily looking for where's the biggest chunk of my audience going and let me create some program for them. That's not necessarily what I'm doing. I'm looking much more for this account or this type of account or this region. Like I'm getting much more granular and creating much more unique experiences and I'm still drawing from the same CMS and I'm still drawing from the same kind of content creation, but it's it, it means more when I'm making those decisions. And I think the metrics, the metrics are less about um, kind of like, can I get a lot of people to behave this way to, can I get this particular account to move forward in their relationship with my organization, right? And there's just so many factors there that, um, you know, we, we just need to get better at listening to that data and making sure that we're, you know, paying attention to it and using it. And I think the technology is there. We're just not always kind of setting it up. So thank you, Skip. Um, Sam, I agree to it, you know, as, as B2B marketers, I think there's just so much work going on on the retention of what we have as well as getting new business. And, you know, so one thing that comes to mind is NPS and asking for feedback on existing clients. And I think that's something that B2C marketers can also, and I'm not saying it's not happening, but I don't see enough of that happening. Asking for feedback on existing clients, on how is the experience with the brand, or are you happy with the amount of emails we are sending you, but B2B marketers tend to do that. And then the retention is so important. Uh, I guess that's something to kind of think about. Yeah, true. I want to I want to get back to the actually Sam you you kind of introduced the uh, topic of stats B two B versus B two C stats but the the other thing um, on the B two B marketers not using data is um, you know one of my small pet peeves so Kath and I agree on pretty much most things but one of the things we agree on is the use of language and how powerful the right use of language can be. And I'm, I think, you know, my second half of 2021 goal is to get rid of uh, the acronym CRM. Because I've never found a CRM that was for managing customer relationships. Every <laughs> CRM I've ever seen is sales enablement. It's about managing a lead to the sale. And then what happens after that, usually the CRM is optimized for that process. And then there's some retention-y stuff on the back end that gets added as an afterthought because the accounts team is, you know, account management team is like, hey, what about us? Um, and so going back to your point, Kath, about uh, B2B marketers not using the data, it's, a, it's shocking how hard it can be to get, I got a lead. Where's that lead now? Did they buy something? How much did they spend? Have they renewed? What was the average order? But, you know, all those kind of things that you, as a B2C marketer, you're like, I know it, right? I can track that person from cradle to grave. Uh, in B2B, it's a lot harder because maybe it's because they have to bounce through so many different systems as opposed to, you know, they come into my e-com system and I got to tie my e-com system with my ESP and or marketing automation system or whatever we're calling them these days and back and forth. But, but yeah. let's... I was just going to so, say that in my last firm... What we did is we decided that there was no um, there was no handoff. The way we solved that problem between marketing and sales is there was and customer service there was no handoff. So we owned the uh, lead from inception to the end to the you know through whatever advocacy at the very end, and so did sales. So they we had everything was co-owned and there was no handoff. And I got to tell you, just the language of saying, you know, we own this together was an incredibly um, 
fruitful way to think about the partnership between um, sales. It wasn't really a sales team, but like, you know, between the partners and the marketing group. Because like, th- we're in this together. And quite frankly, you never, marketing never hands off a lead in B2B. There's all that retention. There's all that nurturing. There's all the brand building, you know, surveys, events. I mean, they never leave us. So who are we kidding? Right. Anyway, I'd love You're to right. hear if anybody else has has done that. That was sort of a an epiphany of just changing the language and it really worked for us. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I've, I've gone in and consulted with many B2B companies and what I always found to be the main... Sorry, Steph, could you turn your... Yeah. What I found to be the, the, the main um, struggle that they had was always between the marketing and the sales team and the marketing team would be saying sales are never happy with the leads and sales are, are not selling so they're saying the leads are poor quality however they weren't poor quality and all the rest of it and there was always this you know toing and throwing and and uh, whereas in reality you do the two teams need to be merged they need to be one team together going from the beginning to the end and that's when the success will happen and then that's when they're going to be more aligned with b2c as well and how b2c works you know, um, B to C. Mira, Mira makes a great point in the chat about w- working together and, and not working together. And, you know, companies that let sales take over the email communications. And of course, that comes across as a salesy kind of tone because nobody from marketing has gone to sales and actually said, this is our brand tone of voice. This is how you write as us. Um, because, you know, well, we just haven't. For whatever reason, Priyanka, Priya, how do you how do, how do you view sales and marketing working together? I mean, so, for some people, it's like that scene in Ghostbusters: dogs and cats living together, total anarchy. How do you? How do you... Um, so I've always been on the marketing side of things, so um, have had that uh, constant battle with sales, with exactly the tone of voice, how they've sold, what they've sold, and then the communication internally to clarify all of that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't, I, I think that unification needs to be there across internal teams before it can be shown to the clients. And um, I have been actually fortunate to see both sides of the stories because I'm not purely in marketing nor in sales. Um, do see everything that you guys are saying that this, as long as, like Priya said, unified, right? We are all running towards the same goal of success, I think, and, and transparent communication, um, that can be really good. One of the things that at Validity we really try to do quite a lot is advocacy. And I think it can work for both sales and marketing because, um, and Sam, you picked up on the influencer bit, right? And it is influencer for your brand. And as long as clients are happy with your company and they are saying good things about it, it can be a very good marketing tool. And it can also be a very good sales tool because then clients are very comfortable being a reference or clients are going and collaborating on webinars, for example, or writing a case study, those are essential sales too. And I've been very fortunate to be a part of those kind of projects where bringing the marketing, bringing the sales, bringing the sales enablement and account management teams together to kind of get those in action. So yeah, it's an interesting question. So, I'm not sure how we got there, uh, and I'm not sure where we're going. Where I was going with that. So we were going to talk about uh, uh, different. Oh, I know. It was we're going to talk about different stats. So way back a while ago, Stephanie, you you um, uh, introduced the notion of different different stats. What are I mean fundamentally? Uh, maybe it, you know what stats. What are stats that B2B marketers use that maybe would benefit B2C and vice versa that, that they typically don't because they don't think of it? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think both both kinds of marketers use life cycles as a, um, a way of expressing the 
impact of marketing, right? So, um, so I think that's very true. But I think in B2B, I think sometimes we get very hung up on making it like a linear type of thing when actually it's very matrixed. And so I think you can't think about your email program as, as, a, as, as an individual channel. You have to think about it in the context of everything else. So if a bunch of your leads are coming in through search, for instance, right, which is where a lot of intent happens, um, we can bring some of those uh, leads further through the cycle through email, right? And so email works very well in that situation. Um, I think that's probably true in, in B2C, but maybe to not to the same extent. Um, and then also I think um, once, once uh, uh, people have spent time on your website and you can start to do remarketing to them, right? Then, you know, then email comes into play again. Um, and then there's just a layer of email that is just reminding people, right? Like we used to be able to collect um, quotes from customers and they would say, well, you know, I wasn't thinking of you guys for solving this problem, but then I got your newsletter or your message or whatever they called it, right? Um, we think of those things as very precious and very different, but actually it's all the same to our customers, right? They just get stuff from us. Um, and so they're like, yeah, I saw that thing. And then we thought of you. So, so again, like email comes into play because we were slowly nurturing them all that time. So I think there's, when you look at your metrics, they have to be tied to where you can have, where email can influence, but knowing that it's in this matrix. And I think we can spend, and I've done this myself, we can spend a tremendous amount of time trying to get attribution to work. But I think if you if you relax on that a little bit and just think about, all right, how can I just th get stuff into the funnel so that there's activity happening constantly, right? And then you sort of focus on the edges where activity dies. Those are some of your, I think, the most actionable metrics, right? Because it's really hard if you try to take every single life cycle and just plot it across and try to attribute it. It's just, it gets too it's not manageable at that point. You, know, you get like two too people messy. in each category and it's not yeah. helpful. Right. Yeah, so yeah. I, I don't know what other people's experiences are, but um, those are the things but, I pay attention to. Yeah. And, and I, I think um, picking up from that, then I, I think that there are two key areas that B2C can learn from B2B. One being the life cycle, right? B2, B2C do use it, but not to the extent that B2B do. They don't, really leverage it at some some brands will only have the welcome email and then that's it and then straight into along with everyone else and then maybe if they drop off they might have a win back program right so that's it you know it needs to be more, more detailed than that so you can have that a welcome period so it's still a prospect because they haven't purchased yet then you can have your first purchase then you can have your second purchase and then you can have your regular customer and your loyal customer and all the rest of it, right? So they could be learning more about that, which I think would would definitely benefit them, um, because that by themselves, just just actually referring to it and understanding where the customer is in the customer life cycle means that they're going to be more personalized as well. You're speaking to where they are. The second thing was. Um, the fact that B2C marketers tend to be very campaign oriented. B2B marketers tend to be, they aggregate everything and they look at the actual, they're more subscriber oriented. They're more focused on where the subscriber is at, what are they doing, what content have they been you know, digesting and all the rest of it. B2C marketers tend to be more campaign oriented and they'll look at the success of a campaign, but they forget to actually look at that subs those subscriber metrics. Um, so I think definitely, and, and these are the kind of things that I think you know it's it's good to get out there and sort of for for the the both of them to actually have a look at and say, well, maybe we can learn a, a little bit from each other. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, we're content marketers, most of us in B2B. And so I think when you think about the types of content that you're creating, there are campaigns within your, you know, your kind of help content, right? Which is like the the latest news that came out or some report that you did or whatever. But then there's hero content, right? Which is about branding and your position and your value proposition. And that can be very terrific in terms of bringing new people into moving from unknown to known, right? And then you have um, help content, which is 
to further down the cycle, right? When someone's actually trying to figure out if they should buy you, right? that's where calculators and, you know, um, uh, help, you know, this is how you can talk to your boss about making this investment, all that kind of help content comes in, right? So, so I think you're right. Like I think in B2B, I sort of always start with the content and maybe in B2C, the content is the sale. Like what's our sale this month? What am I pitching today? Um, and so maybe there's, maybe that's a similar mindset. I don't know. Well, I want to make sure that we have enough time to get to the the roundtable discussion. So, um, one last question, uh, a couple of last thoughts from each of you, and uh, Priya, we'll start with you, and then we'll go to Priyanka, and then Sam, and then wrap up with Kath. So, um, the question is this: Is it time to get rid of the B two B and B two C labels? Because one of the things that I've heard all of you all talk about. Oh, wow, that's slipped into Virginia there. One of the things that all y'all, uh, one of the things I've heard all of you talk about is um, not the Virginia and y'all is bad, uh, is um, that it, it really comes down to what you're selling, how, how expensive it is, and how the person buys. Because somebody said, it, Sam, I think it was you that said, um, mentioned, called out SMB, right? You're, a, you're selling B2B, but that business is buying as a consumer, right? They buy like a consumer. The flip side to that is, you know, how big a database do we genuinely think Bentley has, right? And they might them or Ferrari, right? They probably have a huge database, but if they built a really simple segment of have any chance of buying my product versus fanboys, that any chance of buying my product is going to be pretty small. And it's a high ego involving purchase, large cash value, you know, probably quite a long sales cycle. So I'm wondering if, you know, we go, we, we start talking about B2B and B2C and actually we ought to be talking about labeling it some other way because there are examples in both of people that buy kind of in the other model. Priya, what do you think? Um, I, I don't think we should get rid of the B2B and B2C because they are still very distinct um, in the way they operate. Even though we are talking to people, the things we're selling are going to be different. So examples of you know selling office space versus selling software. Um, however, the learnings are transferable. So everything that you do in a b2b where it's so much more targeted so much more one-to-one -one. they have a representative that they can go to that can all be learning that can be taken over to b2c um as well to make it a much more personalized experience so i think getting rid of them is not the way forward um, and also we didn't touch on any of the legalities between who you know what we can send to who and when legitimate interest and the beautiful GDPR. We, 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 we avoid that topic like the plague. So I'm, we're going to edit that part out. Nobody will ever know that you mentioned it. Um, Priyanka, what do you Done. think? Um, I completely agree with Priya. We, we cannot because it's just too distinct. And the, the word that should not be named here about, you know, the privacy and legalities, just cut it out. But it's different rules, right? I mean, for B2B, B2C peaks are even different. I mean, for B2B, Black Friday that might not even matter because their peak could be depending on the industry and what they're selling. For a medical company, for example, summer and when hay fever starts, it might be their peak. So, uh, and although Black Friday is nothing for them, uh, they're still getting penalized because everyone is trying to stop the volumes going out. So there's a lot of learning between B2B and B2C, but I just don't think we are there yet as marketers to get rid of those labels because best practice is so generalized and leans towards B2C. So maybe we need to create some more best practices towards B2B and then you know have those learning from each other going and doing these kind of sessions more. That's interesting. Sam? I think um, 
Yes, I think we should be friends with each other. And I think we should learn from each other constantly. I think that it would be a great thing if everyone on this event, you know, sort of committed to um, thinking broadly when looking for learnings and looking for ideas. And, you know, I, I call it stealing ideas. It's the best way to grow your business. But um, I have to say, here's something that I think we all share, which is changing the universe and might change the answer to this question in a couple years. And that is the Amazon effect. So I know it's a big week for Amazon with uh, Jeff Bezos uh, stepping down or stepping aside, but it's, um, you know, Amazon has created an expectation among human beings, the worldwide, <laughs> um, to have sort of instant gratification and an ability to to research and to find lots of alternatives and to, you know, like very quick service and responsiveness. And so those factors have influenced B2B just as much as B2C, right? Because the same expectation is true, whether you're like, you know, investigating software or buying a pair of shoes. So anyway, I think that, you know, that effect brings us together. And I think, you know, we're sort of in a shared, uh, a shared set of expectations among our customers. So, you know, um, I think there's, there's a lesson there that we could all benefit yeah. from. Yeah. What, what do you mean I can't get my oil tanker delivered tomorrow? Come on. Depends on yeah, if actually, it's in the Suez able... Canal or not. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's true. That's true. But I mean, you know, I should be able to... What are you talking about? I, I want to buy a fleet of lorries. I can't have them tomorrow. I'll order before 12 o'clock. It'll be fine. <laughs> Kath, you want to you wanna bring us home? Yeah. Okay. So um, generally speaking, I'm not a huge fan of labels, right? Because that's because they can be used to to limit. They can be quite harmful in their use, right? And but then I've also seen that they can be used in a positive way. So it's kind of like, oh, so I, I have a I, I have a family um, a relative who's just on the spectrum, and once he discovered he was on the spectrum, he went, oh, right, so. I now understand why I do this. And he's not limited, but he's understanding and it's helped him a lot. So in that case, that label actually did help. But I've seen it hinder more than help. So as far as the labels go, B to C versus B to B to B, right? I'm totally with you, Steph. Let's not do the verses anymore. Let's do B to B and B to C. And as we've just seen, many of the attendees here are actually and be the C, and as we've just seen, many of the attendees here are actually both, right? So you know, this is what they do every day. They do both, and they understand intricately the similarities and the differences. But as long as we, okay, if we are a B two B marketer, that's fine, right? We know that we're a B two B marketer. Let's not just limit it us and say turn off. That's a B2B present, a B2C presentation. I, I can't listen to it. It's, it's got nothing relevant. So don't let the label limit you in your learning, in your understanding. Be curious. Be, you know, really excited to be getting as many learnings and adapting um, as you can, because that's as marketers, that's what we should be doing. So just don't be limited by those labels. That's all I'm saying. You're muted, Skip. Yes, I know. I was queuing up. I was queuing up the slides, and then forgot to unmute myself. I, I, Kath, I think that's a great point. And the other, the other thing I'd like to add on to that is uh, now, if you're one of those marketers that has more than enough budget, you know, you got more budget that you need, because um, I know that's that's pretty much standard. Right? Everybody has way more budget than they need. But if you're not in that boat. Uh, the other people to go learn from is not-for-profit marketers because if you think you don't have any money, they have less and they do some amazing things, with almost no money. So if you get a chance to go to, to an NFP event, uh, dial into an NFP webinar, take it because you will learn a ton of stuff that will allow you to do a lot more with, with what you have. So, <clears throat> excuse me, that's all we have time for today, <clears throat> but don't go away because we are going to head off uh, to the, <clears throat> excuse me, to the round tables. Um, before we do that, let us know what you thought. Give us some feedback in the chat. Um, and 
join me in giving a big thanks again to our gold sponsors, Iterable and Validity. Uh, Priyanka, thank you for the Validity sponsorship, if you had anything to do with that. Um, and our silver sponsors, RPE Origin and Email Expert. And of course, uh, join me in thanking uh, our wonderful, wonderful panel, uh, Sam, Priya, and Priyanka, and Kath, for providing their invaluable insights. But most of all, um, oh, wait, I say I'm about to wrap up. Ah, yes. Uh, but most of all, I want to thank all of you for uh, spending your time with us today. I know you've got a lot of choices in the content you can consume and uh, busy days. So I'm really appreciative that you joined us, especially those people that joined us from further east. It's quite late in the evening for you. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. Um, now, Kath and I are going to be back on the 20th of July for our last episode of Series 2. Uh, we've got um, Udame Akut, Andrew Bonar, and Elliot Hogg all talking about the art and science of deliverability. That's right, folks. We saved the best for last. Deliverability, if you don't have it, all the other stuff we've talked about in this series is pointless. Now, for those of you who joined us live, we are kicking off the roundtables um, that you uh, may have seen when you first came in. Uh, Priyanka will be joining us on the roundtables. We've also got Ryan Phelan, co-founder of RPE Origin, joining us on the roundtables today. I think I forgot to mention that earlier, uh, kind of as we were faffing or flapping about with, with uh, the, the tech issues. Um, so go find a table, uh, turn on your sound, turn on your video, be part of the conversation. Uh, I say this every time. Don't worry if you're wearing a tattered hoodie. Maybe next time I would wear a tattered hoodie, but you know, <laughs> it's comfy, right? You're working from home. Uh, you know, business up top, party down below. We won't judge. The conversations aren't recorded. Uh, and remember one lucky member will win uh, a copy of Cat's book. Unfortunately, I can't make myself bigger. So there, there you go. It's Cat's book. It's very good. Um, and uh, uh, if you can't join us on the roundtables, join us in two weeks for our last episode of this series. But until then, thank you, thank you again so much for joining us. Be safe and make good choices. <laughs>